there is no hope for me, then I need to get on board and I need to get up to speed and I need to go with the go and everybody would be happy if I would just get out of the way. Now, I want to tell you something this morning that God doesn't want me out of the way. He wants me in the way. Amen. God doesn't want me forgetting about the things that he's given us. He wants me to proclaim the things that he's been given us. And so we're going to talk about how Peter dealt with it in his day. Now, Second Peter, as you already know, is written from Rome. Uh, Peter had been taken, he had been accused, he was about to be uh, uh, crucified upside down, and he wrote the second epistle that bears his name, 2 Peter chapter number 3. And you see, what was going on in Peter's day was that everyone was telling uh, that Jesus was not who he said he was. Everybody was saying that uh, Jesus had lost his uh, favor, that he had lost his time, and that it was something else to go on about, and we needed, or the Christians needed, to just tone it down. Now, Peter writes to a group of Christians, and he says, I want you to know what is going to happen just before Jesus comes. Amen? I, I want you to turn. I hope you're already there. Uh, 2 Peter chapter number 3. And we're going to start in verse number 1 and read down to verse number 7. The Bible says this. Now I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and our Savior, Knowing this first, that there shall, in their last day, scoffers shall walk after their own lust, and they uh, shall be a promise is coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, they continue as they were, the beginning of the creation and of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, word, the word of God, that they should be in the earth and the water and in the water whereby they were done. And the Bible says this in verse number 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same and kept uh, by the name of Jesus in store, reserved unto the day against the judgment and the perdition of unholy men. What is going to happen just before Jesus comes? Amen. My friend, I want to tell you, yeah, someone would say, well, Pastor, you, you don't really know uh, when Jesus is coming. And you are, you are exactly right. In fact, the Bible says that no man knoweth the day or the hour. No man except the Father himself knows the exact moment that Jesus is going to come out, step out, and say, shout out, come up hither. And we as the church and those that are born again are going to meet him in the air. Nobody knows that day. But Peter says in verse number 1 that there are some signs in which we can know what are the last days. Now you say, Pastor, when did the last days start? I'm glad you asked that. The last days that Peter and all the apostles speak of begin on a Sunday morning in Matthew 28, 1, when Jesus came out of the tomb and he destroyed death. That set into motion the day that we call grace, the day that we call uh, the day of whosoever will. And see the time has been moving ever since Jesus stepped out of that grave. Now some 2,000 years later, every day is the last day because every day is that precious day that Jesus Christ could come and split the eastern sky. You see, Peter wanted us to know that when we see these things, that we can know that we are living in the last days. You say, Pastor, does that mean he's coming back today? It could. Does that mean it'll be next year? It could. Does it mean it'll be a hundred years from now? It certainly could. But my friend, I don't want a chance that I'm going to wait to 99 years and get ready on that last year. It could be right now. And Peter is saying that this world that we live in is going to demonstrate to us some bad things that they're going to do in the day that the Lord comes back. That's what we're going to deal with. Number one, the, just before Jesus comes back, the world is going to be full of scoffers. Look in verse number three. The Bible says this, knowing this first, the first thing you're going to realize is that they shall come in the last days, there will be scoffers. Now, what is a scoffer? A scoffer is someone who makes fun of something, someone who mocks something, someone who is all the time against something. And we live in a day and an age to where there's never been a generation that has mocked God 
like this generation. Why, they tell us that there is no God. They tell us that the God that there is is dead. They tell us that the God that there is is dead. Not only is he dead, he's a long distance from us that we can't know God. In fact, people look at me all the time and look at me kind of like I'm a simpleton or someone that doesn't really understand, and they pity me because I believe that God is God. I believe the Bible says that the heavens and the earth declare the glory of the Lord. I believe that he spoke to Moses in the Red Sea open. I believe that he speaks to lions and their mouth shut. I believe that he can speak my name and raise me from the grave. Amen. I believe in those things because I know that I have an assurance that his word is true. But yet the world that we live in today... We are mocking Christianity. They're mocking the name of Christ. They're mocking uh, the very essence of who Jesus Christ is. And they are saying that we are fools. My friend, I want to tell you, I want to be a fool with Jesus. Amen. I want to be a fool for Jesus. The Bible tells us this, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that perish. I want to be a Jesus fool. I want to tell you today that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and His righteousness. I want to tell you that I believe today that there was a man who died upon Calvary's cross and who was placed into a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, I believe that Jesus Christ came out of that grave. I believe those things. And so many people today, they are those that say that they are scoffers. They don't believe it. Now, I've been in medicine for now 38 years, and I want to tell you, I work with some of the most educated people in the world. These guys and these gals, they have gone to school all their adult life. They are very intellectual when it comes to the things of the body, things of medicine, and they will sit and talk to you all day long about the uh, very smallest of things when it relates to that. But when you bring up the name of Jesus, they roll their eyes and they begin to laugh and they begin to scorn and they begin to say, oh, that, that's your fable, Brian. My friend, I want to tell you something today. The Bible says this, let God be true and all men. Amen? All men. I don't care where you got your uh, degree at, amen? You know, so many people today, uh, they're waiting on some preacher to uh, promote them. You know, preachers make big promises. They mock God, you know. They mock Jesus, but they'll stand up and say that they're called of Him. Amen? There are people that, politicians, who promise you everything under the sun, and you'll believe them. But Jesus says, all I want you to do is believe in me. Amen? And you won't believe them. Hey, I don't care where you got your Ph.D. And by the way, Ph.D. simply stands for piled high and deep. Amen? And that's all it means. Amen. You, you can get a monkey to get a Ph.D. You know how you get a Ph.D.? You stay in class long enough, you keep taking the test long enough, and eventually somebody's going to crown you with one of them little flat heads, and they're going to give you some tassel around your muscle, and they're going to tell you that you know something, and all of a sudden you're going to start believing the world and think that you know more than God. Amen. What is it? It is that we have a sense that people are mocked all the time. We have proud people who promised us things that God cannot pronounce. It is through Jesus Christ. And so we see that in the last day, just before Jesus comes, there is going to be an exponential amount of people mocking who Christ is. They are going to say that Muhammad is just as good as Jesus. They're going to say just as much as, as Buddha is as good as Jesus. They're just going to say that uh, the God of the New Age or of the pagan or of this or of that. And they're going to say, but my Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter number uh, 5. And then again in Ephesians, uh, or I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says that the name of Jesus, there is no other God. Amen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 12 says this. He says this, there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said in John chapter number 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you can just mock all you want to, world, because I know Jesus. And I know that Jesus lives. And I know that Jesus saves. And so this world will always stand before you. And as we get closer to that uh, time or that event of his coming, just before Jesus comes, this world is going to ridicule our Savior. They're going to ridicule you. Amen. 
In fact, the Bible tells us those that live godly shall suffer persecution. Amen? You know what the problem is? We want to fit in with the world. We don't want to stand out with God. And so we need to say to ourselves, if this world is full of scoffers, am I scoffing against Jesus Christ? There is a world full of scoffers. The second thing, look what it says. Just before Jesus comes, there is going to be a world full of selfish people. Now get your feet up because I'm about to step on them right now. Get, get their feet up. Preacher, don't be preaching about me. Well, I want to tell you something today that we live in a nation that we are full of selfish people. And I've got a finger pointed back at me. I want my way right away whenever I want it my way. Amen? I, I want everything done for me, but I don't want to do anything for you. I am such a, a, a selfish person that sometimes I am ashamed of myself because I'm asking all the time. Like that little two-year-old that wants one of everything at the checkout line. You know, they just want this, and they want that, and they want this, and they want that. And you tell them, no, what's the first thing they do? They pitch a fit, right? Used to be, if you pitched a fit in the checkout line, you would get motivated all the way to the car. Nowadays, you know what happens? Fifteen people will come over there and say, here, honey, let me pay for that for you. Amen? I can never uh, forget a long time ago, my mother, uh, who had way too many children, I'm just not sure which one was too many, uh, but we were at M.C. Hedrick's uh, grocery store. I'm talking about selfishness. And I can just barely remember hanging, you know, it was me and Jeff and Jimmy at that time, and we were going up and down the aisle, and of course we wanted one of everything. And I was being a really bratty kid. And I don't know who it is, but in my mind, I remember this is like it was yesterday. Some old man in overalls. Didn't ever knew him in my world. And my, wife, my mother didn't know him. Nobody knew him. But all of a sudden, there I was, pitching a fit in front of my mother, selfish as I could be. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit lifted me up by the back of my shoulder. Lifted me up, turned me around, patted me on my personality. Put me back down and told me to hush. You know what I did? I sat there and hushed. You know what we do today? We call DHS. We call the popo. We, we call uh, social services. My friend, I'm telling you this, is that we live in a generation that is so selfish. Not only the two-year-olds, but 20-year-olds. Not only 20-year-olds, but 40-year-olds. Not only 40-year-olds, but some of us guys that are 60 and greater who ought to know better, we are so selfish. Look what the Bible says in verse number 3. It, it says this. It says that they were walking after their own lust. Man, we're supposed to be walking after the Spirit of God. But what we walk after is something that makes us feel good, look good, and act good. We are someone that is selfish in ourselves. And this world, and especially in America that we live in, we are so, so selfish. We believe that the world owes us instead of us owing the world. We believe that someone ought to do for us and us not have to do for ourselves. We are such a people that we are so selfish that Peter says here, he says that they are walking after their own lust to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? They, they are people that way. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pick on anybody except me, but there's times that I get that way. Amen? And then the Holy Spirit and, and that other spirit that lives in my house, that's my wife. They get a hold of me real quick and real fast. Amen? But I'm saying this to you. You need to reevaluate yourself and see, are you someone who scoffs the power of Jesus Christ? Are you someone who scoffs someone that is, is in the Lord or is uh, someone who is uh, uh, trying to serve the Lord? Are you someone that would make fun of them? Are you someone that is so selfish that you're not willing to do for others before you do for yourself? Doesn't Jesus, one of Jesus said this, he said, love your neighbor as yourself, amen? He said, do for others before you do for yourself. And yet we continue to grow up in this nation in a sense that we are so selfish. And that, right before Jesus comes, is going to be a, a, a characteristic of the world. And I want to tell you today that there are way too many scoffers. And there are way too many selfish people. Amen? 2 Timothy 3.1 says it this way. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for many. Amen? 
but he lovers of themselves. In the days, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Amen. You see, we have come to a place. In fact, the Bible says here in Genesis 6, 5, you remember, uh, right before Noah built the ark in Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that the evil, every imagination of thoughts was on his heart, evil continually. Just before Jesus comes, there is going to be a huge amount of scoffing. There is going to be a large amount of selfishness. But the third thing, look, the world's going to be asleep. Amen? Look in verse number 4. The Bible says this in verse number 4. It says, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? You know, Jesus is supposed to come. Jesus is supposed to be here. Jesus, since then, they keep falling asleep. The Bible says that we are people that have fallen asleep. America has been lulled together as a baby in a crib. And we sleep through this world, and the devil destroys families, he destroys marriages, he destroys people, all because people are asleep on the Lord. Amen? It says this, Ephesians 5, 14, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You know what you need? You need a wake-up call. You need a wake-up call. Amen? Romans 13, 11, And that knowing the time, it is high time, to awake out of sleep. I want, and you say, well, Pastor, I'm awake right now. You may not be. You, you might have walked in here. You might have drove in here. You might be looking at me right now. But you could be so spiritually asleep that you miss Jesus Christ because the devil has put you into a dark, dark, deep sleep. Amen? That's what I'm saying. Just before Jesus comes, there is going to be a world full of scoffers and there's going to be uh, that selfishness in the world and there's going to be people that are constantly asleep. This morning, in fact, we've got just a few seats left for people. They don't have to stand up in the hallway yet. Man, where's everybody at? They're sleeping, right? They're sleeping. Look at the fourth thing. It's a world that sets aside Scripture. So, bro, you, you have to say amen to this one. When you were a young man, you, you had a hunger for God's Word. Your church had a hunger to teach God's Word. We, as preachers, had a passion to preach God's Word. Thus saith the Lord, there is nothing greater or grander than the Word of God, but now we live in a world to where everyone has set the Scripture aside. We don't deal with it. We don't... I love it. We don't uh, seek God's word anymore. It is that we have come to a place in our life to where we don't think that we need God's word. Amen? I, I, I'm not going to ask you by show of hands, but God knows. Amen? How much is passing this week? How many times this week have you actually opened your Bible? I'm not talking about scrolling on Facebook and finding a, you know one of those little nuggets that everybody posts. I'm talking about studying God's word. Does the Bible not say to study, to show thyself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed? Doesn't the Bible tell us that the word of God is able to make us wise unto salvation? Does not the Bible tell us that we are to seek his word so that we can know his will? The Bible says this, but in verse number 5, Peter says, just before Jesus comes, there is going to be those who set aside the scripture. Look in verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant. For this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God. Amen? They're ignorant. Matthew 13, 15 says, For the people's heart is waxed gross, or that means thick. They're, you've got a hard heart. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have been closed. Jeremiah says it best in Jeremiah six nineteen. Look what it says. Hear, O earth. Behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruits of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto me the words, nor to my law, but rejected it. The word of God today can be taken or left. Amen. I, I want to tell you, if they can't get you to set it aside, they're going to uh, stir it up. There's so many versions of this word right now, it just brings confusion to everybody, right? Amen. You don't know which one to study. You don't know which one to read. You don't know which one to memorize. You don't know. You know why? Because the devil has diluted God's word so much that you just think that this is just a good book. You don't think it is the book. You think it is a good book. My friend, I want to tell you something. 
The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter number 12, verses 6 and 7, it says as the silver is tried in a furnace seven times, it is pure, purer than gold. Amen? Now, the Bible tells us that God's word will never change. Not one jot or one tittle uh, will pass away. Amen? John 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth, O Lord. Uh, the scripture says, Forever established in heaven. So you would think that something as magnificent and mighty as God's word would be the first thing that we would worry about, the first thing that we would do, the first thing that we would say, but it is not. Amen? Look what it says. God's word is so high that God puts it above his name. Psalms 138.2 I will worship towards the holy temple and praise thy name and thy loving kindness for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God says you've got one job. And that is to know my word. That is, that, but the world sets it aside. I've never lived in a time, and I hope uh, that it turns out, but I don't think it's going to change. It's because... The young people and younger generations, us older folks even, we are setting aside God's Word. Amen? We don't have time for God's Word, but we got time for Mark Zuckerberg. Amen? I, I, we got time to find out... Hold on just a second. Somebody, somebody's just texting. Oh, that's so cute. Here's a little kitty cat. Oh, how pretty. Hang on a second. Uh, oh! Oh! Check this out. Prom pictures. Well, that's pretty cool. Oh, man. Ooh, that girl ugly. Uh, let's keep going. Yeah, let's go. Oh. <laughs> this is absolutely crazy. This is what we do all day long. This is what we do. Oh, oh I didn't know that. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Where was I? Where was I? We're all guilty. Every one of us is guilty of setting God's word aside because we get so distracted by the things of this world. And one of the reasons that we know that Jesus is coming, just before Jesus comes, the word of God will be testified. And we certainly are there. We certainly are there. You say, well, Pastor, I can't understand Oh, I can't understand all the words in here. And some of you guys are going to school for psychology, microbiology, astrophysics. You know what? You don't understand something you don't want to understand. Amen? You don't understand. So, last thing. Just before Jesus comes, there's going to be a sudden exodus. This is the whole, I've, I've got it all up to this one point. This is what I want you to hear. Turn your ears on. Scoffers, selfish, those who are asleep, those who set aside God's word are going to be separated from God. There is coming a moment in time. The Bible calls it the rapture. At the rapture, God will tell God the Father, will tell the Son, bring my children home. And the Bible says in John, uh, Revelation chapter number 4, John speaks, he said, Behold, a door was open, and I, said, I heard a voice say, Come up hither. Those who know Jesus Christ are going to be gone. Those who will remain are going to be here and find themselves in tor torment. Amen? Look in verse number 7. 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7. Behold, the heavens and the earth, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That word perdition means destruction. There is coming a time that Jesus Christ is going to split that eastern sky. He is going to come again. And just before Jesus comes, it's going to be just like it is today. The only difference is that when Jesus comes, time stops. Time stops. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5.2 says this, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon you. It's going to be that quick. You are going to be left upon this earth. 
Revelation 20, 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open. What's the books? First of all, let me show you what the books are. What are the books? There's two books mentioned. Number one is this book. You will be judged out of this book. God says to do it and you didn't, you'll be judged. God said don't do it and you did, you'll be judged. You will be judged by the book that you cast aside, but you're going to be judged by the Word of God. Well, what's the other book? It is the book of your work. Amen? Now, all the wicked are going to have to pay for all their sin. All the wicked are going, who have rejected Jesus Christ, who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior, they are going to stand before God the Father, and they are going to answer for every sin. And every sin will add a degree in darkness and hell. Everyone. It says the dead were judged out of those things which were written. You see, just before Jesus comes, there is going to be a world of separation. Now, the question is, are you going to be here? I'm going to ask Miss Connie, Sheila, would you come? Just get a song. But I feel that we live in a world that takes Christ for granted. I, I believe that we live in a world that even Christians take church for granted. Why, it's something we've always done. When I get time, I'll get to it. Whenever it, it happens, it happens. But, you know, I've got life, Pastor. I, I've got things I've got to do. I've got places I've got to go. I've got people I've got to see. You know what? When you choose something out there over Jesus, you're scoffing. Oh, man. That hurt, Pastor. It's true. When you choose the things of the world instead of following Jesus, in your life, then you're scoffing at him. God, you really don't matter today. Today, God, you, you don't matter today. Maybe next week you'll matter. And then there is so much about, Lord, you're going to ask me to serve others. Yeah. You're going to serve others. You're going to be someone that is selfish, or you're going to be someone that is a servant to others. You know, you're put on this earth to be a servant to others, not serve yourself. And we've got that backwards. I mean, will you be the one who is selfish or will you be obedient in service of God? Amen. And, and if you are, just before Jesus comes, are you going to wake up finally? And some of you are young and you're asleep on God. But there, quite frankly, there's a lot of you that are middle-aged and older that are asleep on God. It's time that you wake up. We need to get up and about our Father's business. And we need to be steadfast in what He says. And we need to be someone that does not set God's Word aside, that we need to stand upon it. Because why? There's going to be a huge separation one day. A huge separation. Safe and secure. Now, would you stand to your feet? Just stand for your feet. I told somebody this morning that today's sermon was one that sometimes you lay on the, 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 the charm, you lay on the smoothness and how wonderful heaven is. Well, today I've peeled the bark back. But I believe that we need to realize that God is going to hold us accountable in how we live our lives for Jesus Christ. We don't have time to be foolishness of the world. We don't have time to be going the ways of Balaam. We don't have time for these things. So today, I'm going to ask you, do you know Jesus Christ? And if you do, will you follow Him? And will you walk with Him? Amen? The choice is totally yours. Would you bow your head? Father, we come to you today. Father, we thank you for this sermon. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you just touch somebody's heart. Touch my heart, Father, as we've exposed ourselves before you. Father, we pray, Lord God, that we would be closer and walk closer to you. Father, let us rededicate our lives. And Father, let us come and know that you have given us a task to do and a testimony to say. And God, we give you the praise. Now, Father.
If there's someone here today 